Good morning, Shepherd's House. It's great to see you this morning. Let's stand to our feet as we sing and declare the praise of our God. Amen.
before we sing the next part of this song, I just want to read a few verses from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke concerning Jesus on the night before his crucifixion and death. Jesus knew what was about to happen to him, and as we approach Good Friday, I want us all to go to that moment and meditate on it together. Jesus and his disciples came to the garden of Gethsemane on the night he would be betrayed. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus, our Savior, he laid his life down to redeem sinners, to pay our debt, to cry out on that cross, it is finished. And as we sing this next part, I want to encourage us to think about Jesus that night in the garden, submitting to the Father's will. Let's worship together.
my fault for not turning my microphone on, uh, but you all would have heard me shouting over there and singing a little too, a little too loud and way off key. If you're new here, my name is Costi. I just want to say a big welcome to you and uh, give you a warm greeting. We love you. Grateful you'd come and worship with us today. If you're visiting here for the first time or you've never done this before, I just want to tell you, please go to the Resource Center right after the service. Get one of those gift bags. There's a free book. There's some free resources inside that will encourage you in the Christian faith. There's a card you can fill out to give us your information. We will not show up at your house unless you want us to. But more likely, we'll send you information on what's going on at the church and keep you posted on things that will strengthen, encourage you. If you want to make this your church home, uh, we can help you with that. If you're one of our regulars and you want to register for the Women's Conference, which is in just a few weeks on April 12th and 13th, uh, you can do that. If you want to give, sign up to be on a team. If you need prayer, update your information. Anything at all, the Resource Center has you covered. And also pick up one of these or a few of them. These are our push cards for Easter. You can take these still this week and give them to friends, family, neighbors, anyone you want to invite to Easter. All the information's on the front and back. The theme this year on Good Friday, he was wounded, and on Easter Sunday, he is risen. I will preach thematic sermons on both of those particular themes, and I promise you what I said last week, I'm going to say it again, I promise you I'll preach the gospel I promise you to make everything clear for those you love and for us. How many of you know we need the gospel every day, amen? We don't graduate from that stuff. We want the gospel, and Easter is a great time to remember the sacrifice of Christ. So this Friday at 5 and 6.30, we'll sing, take communion, I'll preach, and then Easter services, 3 this year, 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11. So plenty of room for your friends and family to join us. A couple other quick things. Uh, I am... Without my wingman, my right arm, my dear brother, uh, Pastor Brett McIntosh is not here today. Everything was a little uh, behind schedule because Brett was not here. I just want you to know that. Uh, prayer circle was a few minutes late. Uh, I don't even, I'm, I assume children's, the wheels are on the bus. All of you look fine who are serving over there. But in general, it's for good reason. Pastor Brett also oversees missions as a part of the, the wonderful uh, role he plays here. And he and Rod Shackelford are in Uganda right now. They left on Thursday at about 10, 20 p.m. to go explore missions opportunities there. You know, if you've been around, that as a church, we are crazy about missions. We got a building campaign coming. We've got a uh, lot to do here, but how many of you remember that Jesus is building his whole church, amen, not just Shepherd's House, not just Chandler, not just our little holy huddle, but everywhere, and we've committed ongoing, the building campaign won't stop that, uh, only Jesus returning will stop that. We will be missional, and this is one of those efforts to uh, establish some partnerships. How many of you guys are going to Fiji in a few weeks, too? I know a bunch of you were in first service. Yeah, we're really excited for you guys. And then how many, a bunch of you are at Radius this last couple of weeks. Uh, Radius is our partner there, training people to go to unreached language groups. And man, uh, pair that with what's going on on Mill Avenue and some of you evangelists out there with our teams. God is reaching people through you. A couple other quick things. It'll go on the screen. Uh, student ministry is going to camp this summer, so you're welcome, parents, for a little break, but also you're welcome for a great time of discipleship and teaching and training and fellowship. We're going to be partnering with our friends over at Grace Community Church and Austin Duncan, who was here preaching a few weeks ago for Gary's installation service. Our students are going to Camp Regen. A bunch of churches get together. There's about 1,500 students, and all of it's there at the QR code. Drew Bauer can give you more information. The camp is in New Mexico, so really easy for us who are in Arizona. And it is a riot. Some of my friends lead it. They are biblical. They're passionate. They're discipleship-driven. And it's a blast. So who knows? Maybe your uh, son or daughter will meet their future spouse. Not yet. Still in high school. But maybe they'll uh, strike up a friendship and be pen pals. Because we really don't want them DMing on social media at that age. All right? Um, we'll teach you how to write with pen and paper again. It's called a letter. Facts. That's Gen Z for like true. I, they don't do that anymore, do they? No. Hey, so close. 
so close. Man. All right. I'm old. Not a bad thing. All right. Let's do this. Turn in your Bibles to, a, not Ephesians. We were there already. Okay. This, see, this messed me up. We're going to restart that. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus calling his first disciples. We've been going verse by verse through the gospel of Matthew. It's been an incredible time. We're not even close to being done yet. So much more to learn and to see. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22 is where we're going to be. Jesus calls his first disciples here. And I I just want to give you this ahead of time so you start thinking already. He called his disciples in a way that was entirely unique to how rabbis and disciples got together in those days. Okay? Like you and I would pick a university, we select one from our menu. We apply. We scrutinize. Like you, maybe pick a church. You, you check it out online, and you look at the website, and then you come, you visit, you kind of see, what's this all about? I want to see it all before I choose to belong. Well, they did the same thing with rabbis. If you wanted to be a disciple and be taught, what you did is you thought about which rabbi you'd want to get under or behind. That's literally the relationship. You'd get behind a teacher who would walk and you would put your feet behind them where they walk. You would be like the person who teaches you. And so they would choose which rabbi and choose wisely, which rabbi they would want to be taught under. Why? Well, because they were going to become like their teacher. And then they would be deployed to go teach. And what shaped them would impact their future and the disciples they made. Jesus comes along and the disciples don't choose him He chooses them. And it means some incredible things for their life, their purpose, their relationships, certainly their comfort zone, and there's going to be some great applications for us as well. If you'll stand one final time, let's read the text together. We'll pray and then jump right in. Matthew 4, 18 to 22. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers... Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two older, two other brothers, rather, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. That is God's word to us today. You may be seated, and as you do, let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Father, we really want to be faithful as your people. We want to be faithful disciples. Why? Well, because we love you, and because you've saved us and called us, you've forgiven us, and you've redeemed us. Also, why, if we could think deeper and and even further, your love is great, and we respond to that. But it's not just the feelings, well, because you love us, we'll love you back. Oh, Father, you are holy, and you are righteous, and you are matchless. We revere you, and we worship you. We love you, and we honor you. Not because what you do for us, not merely because, well, you love us, but because of who you are. You are enough. You are God over all. No one is like you. And my prayer before we walk through these verses is that our hearts would be humbled under you and before you. Help me to be a faithful servant to my brothers and my sisters. Help me to teach and preach with clarity and with accuracy and with application to call them and myself forward from your word into action. Don't let us play the Christian game. Don't let us be shallow end disciples. Help us please to live for you. Oh, what a joy that is. Be with Pastor Brett and Rod in Uganda, open doors 
that you want opened, closed doors if you want them closed, whatever and wherever and however you want us to go. We're ready. We're eager. We promise that. We will sweat. We will give. We will labor. We will teach. We will travel. Whatever you want us to do, we are not only about this local work, but we are well aware that we are part of a bigger storyline and a bigger family, the church at large that you are building. So may we also experience that side of discipleship, to go also and to support those who are going. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. There is in the American church, and the reason I bring that up is because we're here in America, we're in Arizona, certainly a a kind of epidemic when it comes to discipleship. And what I mean by that is not that people aren't saying they're disciples and not that people aren't trying to be disciples, but I would liken it to having a pool in Arizona. Now, I don't know how many have pools, but I imagine a room this size because it's Arizona, we have pools. And we have a pool, although we don't have a pool. We have a pool that I put together every year. It's, it's a nice pool. It's a Walmart pool. It's our pool. And, and it has to be broken down, and, and I think we'll probably have to buy another pump this year. I mean, one day the kids will get old enough and realize, like, we didn't really have a pool. I'll be like, come on, we had a pool. We had, no, Dad, we saw our friends' houses. We did not have a pool. You know, but, but some of you have that pool with the beach entrance. You know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. You don't need to be feel, feel guilty. God's blessed you. Good for you. The beach entrance. And, and what's great about the beach entrance is you can put the kids there and they just kind of hang, Right? They sit there and they chill. They, they feel like they're swimming. They're not, but they feel like it. That's what's important. They get splashed. They get a little wet. They feel the sun. You, you're, you're getting the whole experience, but you are still in the shallow end. There's really not a lot of danger if you stay right there. You're not going to drown. You're not going to get yelled at. Nothing will go wrong, really, if you stay in that little, tiny, shallow end. It's kind of the little kiddie pool. Much of discipleship in our contexts would relate to that. Too many people, far too many people, are feeling the the sun of of church. They're experiencing the splashes. They hear the noise. They're they're there. They're a part of it, but they're staying in the shallow end of Christianity. It's an anemic discipleship. It's an undernourished, malnourished discipleship. It parades as being a disciple of Christ, but it's not. And here's what happens. They go through life, they get further down the road, and all of a sudden the water gets deeper or go further than that. It's not your pretty little yard and your safe little pool and mommy's there and your little life jacket in the shallow end. But no, you you go to the ocean and you start walking. You think, okay, okay, it's here. I can stand. You get further out and waves start hitting you and currents start pulling you and the depths get deeper and pretty soon you realize, oh, I actually don't know how to swim. I don't know how to stand. And people become a casualty of that approach to discipleship. You and I need to think about a text like this and what it really means to be a disciple. How Jesus calls his disciples who he calls to be his disciples, the way that he calls his disciples to live, all of that. Don't sleep on that. Don't overlook that. I don't want you to to think that you're a disciple and really you're a spiritual toddler hanging out in the shallow end. Now, are we all there at some point? Yes. Are some of you there now? Yes. There's an appropriate time for that. Yes and amen. But as you continue to grow in the Christian faith, you should be well aware of what it means to be a disciple. Jesus, in approaching his first disciples, does something different than the culture at that time. He selects them. 
And in this set of verses, I want to unpack three things. Number one, that it was a radical selection. There was nothing average about this, nothing normal. Number two, that it was a radical submission. The way these men responded, it's powerful. And number three, it was a radical sacrifice. We'll unpack all three of these and then finish out with three key applications that you and I can put into action today. Let's look at the first one together. Number one, a radical selection. Verse 18, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, look over at verse 21, because I, I want to combine the selection verses. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of who? Zebedee. Now, Zebedee was in the boat. They're mending their nets, and he calls the two sons. I want you to notice a few things here. I already said it. I just want to make way of reminder how Jesus picked them. He selected them. They did not pick him. And it's a, a beautiful picture of the way the gospel works and the way salvation works in Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were blind and dead, he came and he opened our eyes and he gave us a new heart. That's what Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 all the way to verse 10 are really all about, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and that He made us alive. There is an initiating power that God brings. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I'm going to save myself today. Today's the day. I've had enough. I need a Savior, and I'm going to go ahead and handle this now. No, no. Do you respond that way? Yes. Do, do you say, that's it, I'm going to follow Jesus? Or we sing this song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Did you decide to follow Jesus? Oh, sure. Have you, have you tro chosen to go all in on Christ? Of course. But what happened inside of you was the great physician, Christ, went in there, did spiritual heart surgery, raised your heart to life, and gave you the power and the desire to even want him. Maybe some of you have never thought about that before, and it's okay. We all, in our immaturity and in our very egocentric minds, think, I decided to follow Jesus, and, and I got saved because I, because I, because I. You can say those things, but you need to reverse the order and go, because of Him, because of Him, because of Him. Then you, I, I, I. I served, I gave, I confessed, I followed. Yes, but only because he did it first. He loved you first. He died for you first. He called you first. He awakened you first. Dead men cannot raise themselves to life. And this is a beautiful picture. These men didn't say, we're going to pick Jesus because he's going to be awesome. We're going to pick Jesus because he's going to really bless us. We're going to pick Jesus because he seems to project really well as a rabbi. No, they were fishing, mending, going about their business. And what a beautiful picture of the gospel that Christ came and he said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Some of you, you struggle in your processing of your salvation and your relationship with God, to view God as loving, that He wanted you, and that He's for you, and He thinks of you. You've swung from the other extreme of, hey, it's not about you. You're just a sinner, and you needed a Savior. You deserve death and hell. And we all say, amen, okay. And some of you stay there, and you kind of live there. You're like that. You're just guilty all the time. You didn't even do anything wrong. You're like sometimes me in school, you know, I, I looked guilty even if I wasn't. I still got in trouble. Why? You looked guilty. You look like you did it. You get blamed for it. You kind of walk around life that way. Always waiting for him to just drop the hammer. Wondering, well, I don't know if he would really love me. Or, or you, you, You're overthinking it. He loves you, present active, present tense. He called you, past tense, foreknew you, justified you, redeemed you, planned for you, purposed for you. 
oh, it's, it's about you and that he wanted to redeem you, but it's all about him and that he's the redeemer. And so when you think about life as a disciple, please don't start with being miserable. Please don't start with, oh, I'm just, you know, lucky to be here, lucky to be saved, you know, just lucky to not have fire have burned me alive yesterday. Just chill, okay? We know. We're with you. We were all there. You worm in the dirt, okay? All right. You depraved, wicked, reprobate sinner. I know, okay? But listen, we are a joyful people because of his mercy, because he's called us, because he's chosen to save us, because he's poured out mercy. You and I, we should be happy, the happiest people of all, the most joyful people of all. Why? Because, like Paul says, such were some of you. I know what I was. And he called me, and he's called you. So you look at how he picked them. Beautiful picture of redemption. But can we talk for a second about who he picked? This is fun. They were fishermen, uneducated, unpolished. Now, he's met them before, and this is called, if you're new to this, love it, it's called harmonizing the Gospels. You take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you take the different accounts and the different angles that those authors wrote with for their unique audience, and you harmonize them. It's what the the band did with that passage when they were talking about the lyrics from the song, and they were matching those verses from those passages. It was Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was all accounts of the garden. They put it together, and those lyrics were all there. They were showing you a harmony of what was happening. Well, when you harmonize the Gospels and Jesus' call of his disciples, you see that in John 1 verse 35, he's met these guys before. They, they, They went back to fishing in a sense because he didn't say necessarily, like, you follow me now and there particular moment with him initially, or when they got to know him or see him or they heard about him. Some of them were uh, John the Baptist disciples that went and followed Jesus. What does Matthew want to do? Why are we given this vantage point? It's because Matthew wants to show you and I the definitive, authoritative, immediate call of Christ. That now, while they know him and know about him, he's going to call them to be his disciples, his learners. And can we reflect for a moment on the disciples at large, this group? None of them are Pharisees. None of them are religious elites. None of them have it all figured out. They're competitively driven, that's for sure. How do I know that? Well, because remember, they were arguing about who would be the greatest, and Jesus had to correct them and say, guys, whoever serves is the greatest. We know they're competitive. Certainly, James and John were, at least their mom was, and they got it from their mama, Mom comes to Jesus and says, can my son sit on your right and left side? Like, can, can, can my boys have the special seats? And he is to correct her. Peter's a big mouth and a hothead. Matthew's a tax collector. Everybody hates those. Even as April 15th approaches, we get annoyed. Philip is a rationalist with really not a lot of faith. Why do I say that? Because we can look at it another time, but right before Jesus feeds the 5,000, okay? This is fun. The Bible says that he tests Philip. He asks him, hey, what's it going to cost to feed all these people? He's testing him. Philip, being our beloved left brain Excel spreadsheet wizard, does the calculations, you know, carry the two, you know, all his little formula, sum, equal, and all that or equal sum. Some of you are already twitching. Relax. Uh, And he comes up, we don't have enough, Jesus. We don't have enough. And and what does Jesus do? A moment later, he turns five loaves and two fish into a massive feast, okay? Philip, later on, to his credit, leads the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ in Acts chapter 8, and then Luke records in the book of Acts, and then he, he wasn't there, and then he was here. So he got teleported. He was living the supernatural. For all his left brain rationalism, he was all over the place with miracles. It was awesome. Thomas will believe it when he sees it. I mean, this is not exactly the superstar group filled with number one draft picks. It's not the all-star team. But you know what they are. Don't miss just the basic thing here. They're busy. 
and they're hard workers. They're getting after it. Peter and Andrew, they got their nets in. They're going to be hauling in fish. James and John, they're mending the nets so that they can fish. These are busy, hardworking, blue-collar types. I like what Phillips commentates. He says, God always calls busy people. We'll just stop there for a second. I'll finish the quote. I think sometimes we're hard on busy people. We're like, are you, are you busy? Do you have time for God? I get it. It's very spiritual, very like American devotional, Jesus calling. Like, am I too busy for you today? I don't know. Is that you? like, okay. Can we just talk about how God actually uses busy people? And what he does though, he takes your busyness and he makes it biblical. You're supposed to be busy. I'm supposed to be busy. Phillips goes on, the Lord's work is no place for lazy individuals. A slothful minister of the gospel is a disgrace to the high calling of God. So no, they don't have it all together, and you got to love it. But you know what? They're busy, they're hard workers, they're go-getters, and God has called them to do it. I think of some of you, you're like this. I think of our church plant and kind of our, our church family, and the way that you know, people have, have asked, you know, how... How, how did you guys this, and, and what about this, and, you know, what'd you do for that? And I'm always kind of like, I, you know, I don't know. And you're like, well, what do you mean you don't know? You know, there's no strategy. Or I'm like, no, we thought we had meetings. But in the end, people showed up. People got after it. People woke up, and they weren't like, Costi, what do, what do we do? What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, okay. You know, it, it, people got up, and they had a lane. And they didn't really look around and worry about this. I got something to do today. I'm going to do it. Why? Because there's something bigger that I'm a part of. There's something I'm pushing for. There's a goal that I have. I think that that is the way that God works through people. Not the superstars, not the, the super talented, not the know-it-alls, but the people that are willing to get in there and get after it. People willing to put their spiritual work boots on. People willing to have calloused hands. I don't have great ability, but I've got availability. I'm here to serve. I've got a humble heart. I'll do it. God loves to use people like that. Why? Well, they're already moving. He just redirects where they're going. I think too often we're, we're looking for, you know, the superstars to kind of do it all, and, and we will feel a sense of, of inadequacy. Well, we, you know, we don't really know how. And, all. And, and like Philip, we're all very rational. How? Well, how? Well, how? God does the how. You and I do the what. We're going to just show up and be obedient. And I want to consider also what he's called them to. Not just how he called them, not just who he called But what he's called them to, it's a change in direction. Don't miss the phrase, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Let me just kind of piggyback on the point I was already making. Notice Jesus would do this to them and through them. Follow me. You respond with obedience. Okay, Lord. And what did he say? I will make you fishers of men. Who does it? Him. Who does he do it through? His disciples. You don't need to worry about the how. You don't need to get lost in all the weeds of the details. You don't need to overthink yourself into a, a, a stupor and, and then your, your you know, paralysis by analysis is kind of one of the phrases that I often think of in my own life and, and, and I'm sure you do as well. It's simple. Just take the next step. Well, what's going to happen? He knows. He knows how. He'll do it. I think of John 15, 5, when Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And then he goes on to say what? Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when you're worried about how it's going to all work, congratulations, Captain Obvious. We all know that that's the hard part. He knows. Leave it with him. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Don't try to do it yourself, but also don't worry about it yourself follow him. That's what he calls the disciples to do. And choosing the unlikely candidates, by the way, is is how God works. It's one of his favorite ways to work. 
Let me just give you a few. Abraham, he's childless at almost 100. God says you're going to be the father of many nations. That doesn't make sense. Perfect for God. Moses has speech problems, okay? And he's going to lead, you know, a million plus Jews out of Egypt into the promised land. He has a major speech problem. He's not very articulate. He's highly insecure about it. God gives him an errand. God gives him a staff. God says, get to it. Gideon only has 300 men to fight tens of thousands in his enemy armies. He wins. David, one of my favorites, he's out in the field tending the sheep. Prophet comes, lines up all of Jesse's boys. And man, they're looking good. I pictured, you know, tallest to shortest, the obvious one. And then he gets to the end of the line. It's none of them. The prophet says, you, you got any more? Well, yeah, there's one. He's out in the field. He's the shepherd. He's kind of a little ruddy guy. You know, you know you, give me him. God says, that's the one. Why? Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. You think of Paul the Apostle. He was a persecutor of the church, least likely to be the leading missionary of the church, least likely to be the ambassador of the ambassadors. And then he goes on to write some 13 of the 27 New Testament letters. If you want to debate that he wrote Hebrews, God bless you. There you go. You can have your 14. In the end, you got Paul doing incredible things as a, a sort of runt of the litter. He calls himself the least of the apostles, like the last guy picked at dodgeball during recess. That's Paul. When God called these men, they didn't have to be superstars. They just had to be obedient. And when God called Paul, he didn't suggest that he maybe consider perhaps dabbling in some ministry. He didn't approach them and go, hey guys, you, you might consider uh, fishing's great, but have you ever given a thought to uh, maybe kind of Checking, checking out, following me, maybe. Try it out. If you don't like it in 30 days, your money back guarantee. None of that. God calls us in the same way. He isn't suggesting we follow. He commands it. Why? Because he knows he's the best thing going for us. And he knows what he's going to do with obedient, faithful, show up kind of people. Not perfect people, just obedient people. I'll follow. You're going to have to check on me a lot, Lord. You're probably going to have to pull me a lot of the way. Well, no kidding. He does it. But you got to be willing. you got to be faithful. you got to be obedient. A disciple is called to take up their cross and follow him. And maybe you think, well, I'm not God's type or, you know, I, I don't know enough. I'm not good enough to follow him. You know, I, I, I just don't think I'm enough. You know, no problem. Perfect. You're exactly God's type. He's not looking for people who know that they can do it. He's looking for people who are certain they can't do it, but they know he can. Have you ever taken one of those personality tests? Like the Myers-Briggs stuff, and I think there's the six, uh, six working levels of genius, or whatever, six types of working genius. Uh, there's the CVI index. You know, there's all these ones, and each one swears that, like, it's the one. I've looked into all these. I've taken them all. And look, I don't put a ton of stock in these tests, especially, you know, when they get super psychological and kind of weird. But they can be helpful for understanding what makes people tick and the way people work. Some of them. Some of them are weird. So don't take this as an endorsement to whatever you Google. Costi said. No, I didn't. But for example, you could have two people and you're, you're trying to build a team. Corporate America uses this. Sometimes in the church we use this. We've taken those tests. And, and what it makes you do is go, oh, that's why you're the way you are, in a good way. It would be easier if we'd all just go to 1 Corinthians 12 and study spiritual gifts, but people like tests with multiple choice. And what you find out is that person is really not a cantankerous suppressor who wants to hold you back from achieving your vision, they're actually very prudent and very smart. 
They don't want you to burn the thing to the ground. And so when you understand the way they're wired, like maybe they're a banker, you begin to respect the uniqueness of their wiring, right? And maybe you're one of those right brain creatives, you're all over the map. If we made a painting with you, it'd be like one of those splash paint things. They throw it everywhere and sell it for 20 grand. It's like, look at the art. I'm like, what is that? We're thankful for you. You're a creative. You're a visionary. You're wild. And sometimes people will look at you and go, you know, you're just out of control. No, God actually made you that way. So we could see these differences and we can celebrate them and we could appreciate them. And sometimes they help us build better teams, and some people are more tenacious, and there's enablement, there's wonder, and all those. You can go read the books later. As long as they don't limit people spiritually, you can do whatever you want with those tests. Here's the danger. I remember one time I was, I was in a, a church setting, and a man came in, and he, he gave us all the test. We're testing. And after the test, everyone puts their results out, and he started telling the leaders which ones would have big churches, which ones would have little churches, which ones would fail, which ones would succeed. Who, he was like a, a, you know, a clairvoyant, apparently. He could tell the future based on my multiple choice. What if I lied on my little multiple choice Scantron? He was selling the idea that if you take the test and you get your little letters or you get your little, your one this and two that and max that and, and, and minimum that, and that he could tell you what's going to happen. Here's where that stuff drives me nuts spiritually, and I want to encourage you with this. Some of you, you, you think of labels and you think of gifting and you think of different things, and you start imagining that that's like the ceiling on what God could do through you. And that's what drives me nuts as a pastor. I hate it. I use that word on purpose. I hate it. Why? It limits people. And it makes them think that God is limited by some silly test. And what you will then do is do less of certain things, or you'll begin to doubt, or you won't think that God can use you because you're whatever four letters in the abbreviations, or you're this or that. And this is the mockery that God makes of man in this text. Everybody thinks they know how to do it and how to get it done. Or worse, people think that they can't do it and that it can't be done. Both ignore God's power. He takes these guys who I think would have had very, very poor Myers-Briggs results or whatever else. And he changes the world with them. I think some of you need to rework your thinking on how God can do anything with anyone so long as they are willing to follow. Some of the greatest missionaries in history were the most unlikely candidate, physically, spiritually, emotionally, from a training standpoint. Some of the people God used so greatly in ministry, they were so weak so uneducated, so not the number one draft pick, it was perfect. Why? Because God gets all the glory. That's the fun part, church. He's not looking for perfect people, superstar people. He's looking for available people. And if you've got great gifts, praise God. Doesn't mean now you have to worry, well, he only uses the runt of the litter. I'm pretty smart at this. No, you just bring that gift and say, it's for you. Use it however you want. And God does amazing things with that kind of humility. But there's also not just a radical selection, also a radical submission. Look at verse 20. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then look at verse 22. Let's group these together. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Peter and Andrew, they're casting nets. James and John, they're mending nets. There will be no fishing for their business. There will be no fish being hauled in and no nets going out to haul in fish if they don't do these things. You pair that with James and John being with their father in this case, which very patriarchal culture. You'd honor father, honor mother. You wouldn't just bail on your dad. Matthew includes that. It's not inconsequential. They don't debate. 
They don't argue. They don't, they don't even say, hey, sounds good, Jesus. We're just going to haul in this load. We're going to gut them, clean them, get them to market, get them on ice. And, you know, we're going to sell them and, and then divvy up the profits. And then I've got to go home, take a shower because we smell like fish all, all day, you know. And then, and then we'll catch you over there when we get a chance. No, it's immediate. Immediately they left their nets. It's a radical submission to Christ. He beckons, they fold. Is that the way you are? Is that the way I am? Can Jesus alter your course with just a word? You read it in the Bible and you go, he said it. I got to do it. Why? Does, Does he own your heart? Are you captivated by him and held captive to him? I mean, this is the way they respond. Again, they were never perfect. Peter was corrected so many times, but he kept showing up. Is your time with the Lord life-altering? Does he have that kind of power over you? Can you ever go back once he's opened your eyes? I think these are important questions to ask because you can determine very quickly whether you are a superficial, shallow-end disciple or maybe not a true disciple at all, and if you are a true disciple, imperfect but willing and available and growing. Why? Because Jesus can disrupt you any time and you're good with it. He comes into the picture and they submit. Spurgeon says this, the call was effectual. No nets can entangle those whom Jesus calls to follow him. They come straight away. They come at all cost. They come to quit old haunts. They come to follow their leader without stipulation or reserve. You got stipulations for God? You got like, I'll follow you as long as you do this, 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 and this. I'll follow you as long as they do this, 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 and this. I'll do my part as long as you don't bring stipulations to God. He writes the terms. He puts it before you and says, follow me. They couldn't resist. They couldn't turn away. They submitted to him, and then there was the radical sacrifice. Third, let's look at those verses again and consider this from a a different angle. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. They sacrificed by following him. Now, here's what we make, I think, a little too much of, and we need to be careful exegetically, and at the same time, it was a sacrifice. Very often we look at these texts and we start thinking, to follow Jesus, you got to be like the disciples. And the way this worked is he came up to them in their boats and he said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And then they, James and John, looked at Zebedee and they said, see you, Dad, we're out. And he went, what? What are you doing? And they're like, no, we follow Christ now. And Zebedee got mad. And that's why later on Jesus says, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brother, you can't be my disciple. You know, it was like super hardcore. And then we picture these guys going on their, their, their tour with Jesus, and they never even went home. And one day they're in Galilee, and they're sort of, you know, maybe swinging by a certain region. And it, it's, I just picture, you know, James or John's wife out on the patio, and she's like this. And the kids are like, Daddy, Daddy. And he rolls up, gets out of the boat, and is like, hey, so I know that, you know, that day I just kind of peaced out and left, and you didn't really know what was happening. You kind of heard rumors. Listen, Jesus, when he calls you, you got to go. So, listen, I'll catch you around, but it's all in or all out. I'm following him now. Okay, kids, good luck. Love you. Huh? You're going to be all right. Okay? He brought you to it. He'll see you through it. Okay? <laughs> We're good. I'll see you later, babe. I'm out. And then you like go away for a long time and maybe you dip in again and it's like, man, where's, where's dad? He's following Jesus, you know? Man, so to follow Jesus, you got to bail on your family in the middle of everything and, and you don't love him. No, no, no. You got to understand. Okay, I want you to see this with, with proper biblical eyes. The region wasn't massive. It was still decent, but, but not massive. These men were in and out of their homes. They were around their family. Jesus prioritized family. He loved family. He's on the cross. He says, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. He takes care of his mother all the way to the grave. He 
treasures marriage. He reaffirms it when the Pharisees are testing him about divorce. He loves children. The disciples try to block kids. You remember that? And he goes, get out of here. Let the children come to me. He loves family, loves marriage, loves children. But this is sacrifice for a few reasons. One, it would have drastically reduced their livelihoods. It's not that they never fished again, but they never fished like they were again. They were on mission following Jesus. There was a sacrifice. Their family lives were interrupted. Their loyalties reprioritized. So no longer did they just kind of do them. It was whatever Jesus wanted. It's Christ who puts himself above every other priority, above livelihood, above money, above family, above ambition, above personal goals even, everything. I want you to do something with me as we land the plane here. We're going to turn a few places. Just turn over to Matthew 10, and I want to show you the radical sacrifice of discipleship and what it really means. I do not want some of you to live under the banner of false advertising in the American church and when it comes to discipleship. You need to know the truth. Matthew 10, look at verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. What's he saying? He'll explain it. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. What's his point? He's saying, you kept the peace You kind of were on cruise control, doing your thing, while it was just about you. And generally speaking, if you live for you, you're not going to rock the boat a lot. But once you follow me, once you say I'm Lord, once you look to me as Savior, once you say I will obey and follow, guess what? Everybody else comes under our relationship. You don't love anybody else more than you love me now. You don't care what anybody else thinks like you care what I think. It's not an attitude or a chip on the shoulder. It's simply so much affection for Jesus and so much loyalty now that you're running that direction. Now, by God's grace, I hope that you and my family and your family, I hope that many of our family members all have the same affection because then what do we do? We run together in that direction. It's beautiful. But many times there will be moments where your loyalties to Christ get you in hot water with family or friends because you're not willing to disobey God in order to please man. Jesus says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter, not worthy of me. More than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross, follow me, is not worthy of me. His whole point is, I've got to be everything. I am everything. Turn over to chapter 12. Look at verses 46 to 50. This is beautiful. This would be my prayer for us as we grow together. It's a change in relationships. Jesus making a point. While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. I want you to picture you get the text. You ever know that kind of pressure? Like, we're out here. We need to talk. Come outside. Someone says, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, don't miss that word. He said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. What's he saying? Who cares about your blood family? No. What he's saying is that many times over, some of the things that we experience out there actually bond us in here. Some of the people that are in this room will be closer to you than even your blood relatives for one reason, and it's because you both love Christ in the same way. That's what discipleship is. Last one. Go over to Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, just a couple of gospels over. Jesus has fed the 5,000. He's done miracles. I always picture if they were to name his tour, you know, it was like food trucks and miracles, like the tour. And that was what Jesus was doing. And everybody was excited and everybody was coming. And so as the crowds grow, Luke 14, verse 25, he does the most non-church growth thing ever. 
Large crowds were going along with him. He turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, that word just translates a lesser love in the original language. His own father and mother and wife and children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Has it cost you anything to follow Jesus yet? I'm not saying you need to go be some legalistic, you know, ascetic where you're you're trying to make things hard for yourself. I'm just saying... When you come to a decision and you know, if I, if I shirk on this, I'll keep the peace, I can kind of repent later, I'll work it out with God. Or do you make the right decision no matter what? Why? Because you are a follower of Jesus. He's called you. It's not a negotiation. He said, you're mine. Are you sacrificing in ways that maybe you never used to? Are some relationships strained because of your loyalty? I ask you those questions. They're personal for you. Between you and the Holy Spirit, you think through those things. If the answer is no, 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 not really, no, no, then, then either we're just, you're not there yet and it's coming very soon, but if you've been saying you're a Christian for a long time and it's generally been this sort of utopian, uh, smooth sailing paradise, I would ask that you begin to think deeply about how you're living. Because if a disciple lines up behind the rabbi, the teacher, and the master, and where he puts his feet, the disciple puts his feet, then where the master goes, the disciple will end up. And I don't know about you, but last time I checked in my Bible, Jesus walks into, at least sometimes, a little bit of trouble. Therefore, if you're not finding yourself walking into some challenges, some trials, some situations where you have to make hard decisions. I want you to pray. I want you asking, am I really following Jesus closely? Am I even following Him at all? It's a radical sacrifice to follow Christ for real. Let me give you three ways to put the truth into action today, and then we'll pray. Number one, When you think about Jesus selecting these men, look, you can't go long without thinking how amazing he is for doing that. So exalt Christ with a thankful heart. You didn't get saved by accident, friend. You didn't muster up enough good works and good intentions to make God save you. He did the work. And so what other response is appropriate except worship, to exalt him? Exalt him with a thankful heart. Wake up tomorrow, not most concerned about you, but most concerned with him. Wake up tomorrow again, prepared to worship. Worship is not on Sunday, it's a lifestyle every day. Why? Because he has saved you, he has called you, he has loved you, he has known you, he is for you. I think it's important for us to, to meditate on that. I think we, we do well, we've got it, that we were dead, we were lost, we were not good enough, we were depraved, reprobate, hellions, fire was going to fall, I got it. I think some of you, you, you need the reminder, we all do, but some of you, you, you kind of wallow in guilt and self-pity and you're so worried because maybe you have a misguided view from your father on earth or from just religion or somebody hurt you, and you keep seeing God as sort of this like, you're just lucky to be here. No, 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 no. You wake up every day with confidence that He selected you. He saved you. Have confidence. We should be some of the happiest people. Should we not be some of the happiest people around? We're saved. His grace and mercy has found us. If you're miserable, maybe you need to Study soteriology some more, the doctrine of salvation, and realize it would have been far worse if you were in control of your salvation, friend. He's been good. He saved you. Number two, embrace obedience with a joyful heart. Now, you know the double, the double clutch or the stutter step. You know, I don't know. Really, you didn't see that with the disciples. And what a picture for us to be stirred by. There's no what about, what about, what about, what about. And, and why I phrase it this way, embrace obedience with a joyful heart, is we get a little weird with obedience, I think, sometimes. We get a little squirrely. We don't, 
We don't want to swing into legalism, and, and we don't want to make it about what we do. And let me just say, you, you got to stop creating false dichotomies. Like obedience and, and his love are just two different things. It's all the same. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you obey me. If you love me, you keep my commands. First John tells us his commands aren't burdensome. I don't know what's weighing you down, friend. I don't know what's triggering you when you hear the word obey, but there is a better way. There's a hopeful way. There's a freedom you can have that when you hear that word, you think, yes, I want to. I love you. Well, what if I don't? Well, then you obey the command to repent and you confess your sin. And what does he do? First John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He washes you. And what do you do? You crawl on your knees until you're good enough to get, no, you get up and you walk with confidence in his grace and you embrace the next step of obedience. With what? A sour heart? No, a joyful heart. I think there's two reasons we overreact to obedience. And then you look at the disciples and no one was like, hey, Lord, seems a little legalistic that you would call us to obey. You know, I, I got some things to work. It, it seems a little intense, you know. We need to get our law gospel dynamic straight here, Jesus. No. There's two reasons we do this weird stuff in today's mostly reformed world. An overreaction to legalism. And yes and amen. I can't stand legalism and people who make everything about your behavior making you good enough for God. If that's you, be free in Jesus' name. Please today come talk to me. But some of it isn't, isn't that. It, it's, a, it's a sensitivity in the conscience. It's they're guilty because they've been looking at pornography. They've been cheating in some area of their life. They've been stealing money. They've been lying to people. They've been talking with profanity. They've been living like the world. They come into church and hear, you need to obey God. And then all of a sudden, legalism is real convenient, isn't it? Who are you to tell me what to do? It's all grace. Yeah, well, maybe you should start walking in grace because grace isn't a license to sin. It's an invitation to walk in his righteousness. And yeah, you'll fail, but you get up another day. You walk in repentance and forgiveness. He washes, cleanses you, and wash, rinse, repeat. It's not this thing like, oh, I get to do what I want. And I think that we need to remember to embrace obedience with a joyful heart. I don't know about you, but I need his commands in my life, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my work life, in my relationships. Anybody else? I need his direction. I'm glad he calls me to obey. I'd mess it all up if it were me. Roger Staubach, famous old football star, led the Dallas Cowboys to the world championship in 1971, one of the last times any of you Cowboys fans had something to cheer about. Don't worry, I'm a, a Toronto Maple Leaf fan in hockey. We're the, we're the Dallas Cowboys of hockey. It's been since 67. It's worse. <laughs> Staubach had an issue. He wanted to call the plays. He didn't like that Tom Landry, the legend, by the way, would call the plays and he had to run them. Coach Landry sent in every play. He told Roger when to pass, when to run, and only in emergency situations... Could he consider changing the play and he had better get it right? Even though Roger Staubach considered Landry to have a genius mind when it came to football strategy, pride said he should be able to run his own team. Later on, Roger Staubach, the legend, said, I faced up to the issue of obedience. And once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. Some of you, you just got to kind of get over it. His way is better. And finally, expect challenges with a hopeful heart. All of you, me, all of us together, we're going to experience difficult situations. Don't be discouraged like this isn't how it was supposed to go. Yeah, it's exactly how it was supposed to go. Trials are a part of the Christian life. He suffered, you will. He experienced challenges, you will. You may not lose a job. You may not experience division in your family. Maybe you'll experience both of those. Maybe uh, you'll have to uh, leave a church or leave a state or you'll lose relationships. Maybe it would even be in your home with children, with your marriage. I don't know. Whatever that situation is for you, you can rest assured that you're not the first, you're not the last, but in all of it, you're never alone. You follow your rabbi, your teacher, our master, the Savior, the Lord, 
in his way. And here's what Jesus did not guarantee. He didn't guarantee the pathway would be easy. He just guaranteed that the pathway would lead to victory. Let's pray. Father, help us to be faithful disciples because we can't do it without you. Heal broken hearts today. Convict what needs to be convicted. Comfort those who need to be comforted. I pray that as a church family, we would love Jesus all the more. That when he says it, we'll want to do it. When we fail to do it, we'll look to him in repentance. And that in your forgiveness and your love and your grace for us, we would be filled with zeal to continue to walk this path. Now, we stumble along. You're so gracious. Oh, we mess it up sometimes. You're so patient. I pray that we would just be encouraged to take the next step another day, remembering that it's not great ability you're looking for, but availability, a willing, obedient, submissive heart. Give us that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I love you. Thanks for rolling with us today with the amount of people and the traffic. It was a little crazy and a little longer. Prayer team's here if you need them. Can't wait to see you on Good Friday. Love you. Bless the